Oh. Hey folks, it's Yannick Guzdala. It's the Yannick Guzdala podcast. Monday, October 14th, 2024. And Monday is important um, as we run down what what's going on in my brain right now. It's the, the feeling of uh, impending doom is a little bit a uh, little bit dramatic, I would say. And uh, for all of you watching, I've realized I've forgotten to put on a couple of lights in here, which may help the YouTube situation a little bit. Um, so I'm going to put those on whilst recording. So highly professional. Um, but yeah, the sort of feeling of impending doom in the sense of, let me explain, um, got a really nice gig coming up on Saturday. Um and playing with people I love to play with people that are close friends, people that are uh, heroes of mine um, playing music that is really, really special to me. And um, someone I've only played with a couple of times before and uh, don't get to see or hear as often I was, uh, as I would like Larry Golding's playing keyboards. Um, of course, Bob Reynolds playing saxophone, Clarence Penn playing the drums. We're playing the music of sort of a decade of Clarence playing with Michael Brecker. So a ton of music that I'm really familiar with and I'm uh, such a huge fan of and have been for many, many years. Um, but the feeling of impending doom, uh, that side of things comes from the fact that things have just been so insanely busy here that I have not been practicing. I haven't been doing the thing that I, you know, suggest everyone who listens to the podcast do, uh, which is be consistent with your practice. I just haven't been doing it. Sometimes that's the that's the reality. That's the reality of life. And here we are Monday. The gig is Saturday. I have like six days to get my shit together, basically. And I figured it would be perhaps interesting to some people um, to share how I do that and how I go about getting who knows actually where I get my playing back to, but it's more a question of getting the confidence um, back to a place uh, that, that I need it to be, regardless of the actual notes and what ends up coming out. It's that feeling of, and I, I think it will always be better when, when I have that confidence. I will end up playing nicer notes. I will end up making better decisions in the moment and it'll be a more fun gig and I'll be able to... Uh, I'll be able to add to the situation and help improve the situation for everyone else around me if I have that confidence. So I'm going to take a look look at a couple of the things I do to sort of fast track that process. Um, it's not something I recommend doing, but sometimes it is just necessary. Sometimes you simply don't have the time to get your playing to where it needs to be or to where you would like it to be or where it should be at. So we'll get into that. And the reason it's so crazy, um, and we'll get the plug out of the way at the beginning of the podcast here, is because we're in the, the, the coming down the home stretch of finishing the new book, The Bassist's Book of Scales and Arpeggios. That is open for pre-order right now. That pre-order closes November 26th. The book is out November 27th. Um, this is something we don't normally do, but we're bundling signed physical copies of the book with the digital copy. That's the bundle. That's what's on offer for the pre-sale. You get both things. Um, you'll get access to the digital one a little bit sooner because that will be finished before the, the uh, physical book is printed and signed and shipped to you. One thing I should um, mention, as I've seen it happening a bunch, you know, we've had a ton of pre-sales so far, and some of you are ordering more than one physical sign book, which is amazing. Can't thank you enough for that. Uh, I should just make that very clear that everything will ship together. So even though you've ordered the new book that isn't out until next month and you've ordered other books that are out right now, um, rather than double the cost of what it would cost me to ship it out there, all of them will ship together um, with the new book, basis, the Basist's book of scales and arpeggios. We still haven't figured out the end of that name. There was some discussion about whether it should include the term broken chords in the title. And there's also the idea, you know, the fact that I'm including studies, not necessarily etudes, but really studies about how to gain flexibility and really put all of these scales and arpeggios and, and modes and everything that's in the book, how to put that into your playing, like a real method. Um, it's going to have the reference portion of the scales and the arpeggios and, of course, the broken chords. It's, it, I'm still including them in the book, um, but perhaps it's the bassist's book of scales, arpeggios, and studies. That may be 
that may be the best way to describe what the book does. So beyond being able to go and look up what, you know, G flat double harmonic major is and have fingering and bass tab and all that stuff, you'll also get some uh, studies um, in the book, in, in the last section of the book, it, it, you know, how to get this into your playing how best to get that flexibility in your in your in both hands actually i mean mainly it's the fretting hand in so many of these cases but it is the coordination of both hands and speaking of which that is one of the things that disappears from my playing the fastest that's one of the things that i get most anxious about where i don't feel i have the confidence you know like i said for this gig coming up in six days by the way everything is linked below signed physical copies that whole pre-sale sorry is linked below in the description of the video um but yeah let's get to barely play, play like five notes or something before just a, a few seconds before i hit record so this is really the the first notes of the day um and yeah like i said it's that coordination between the two whether it's just playing whether it's literally just playing a major scale or whether it's playing some yeah an exercise a study um that's that's the kind of thing i'm putting in the book and i've created over the years so many so many little ideas like that to get those those shapes get those sounds get that harmony into your playing and here it is paying off you know even before this book is out i've been using all these things for 30 years so i have them in my in my vocabulary in my toolbox and that's what's paying off that's kind of one side of it in in terms of accelerating the confidence back to life in my playing um but like I said, it's the time. I think the time or the coordination thing is the first thing that gets lost when you don't practice for a while. Um, and something I like to do is is, is employ a, like massive amounts of repetition. And one of the byproducts, I'm going to play something out of Bass Player's Guide to Sight Reading. This is one of my books, also available in the in in the description of the video below. Um, one thing, like a lot of the books, this comes with play-alongs. One of my favorite play-alongs that I put in there was a head, a melody that I wrote over Chick Corea's Gotta Match chord changes. And it's something, especially for the melodic side of my playing, and sort of the details and it's quite a specific tempo so it's, it's taking care of a bunch of things in terms of my practice there it's two minutes and 43 seconds long i'll play it from start to finish that might be crazy boring uh for anyone listening but if you do manage to make it through the whole two minutes and 43 seconds of this you'll see number one how much can be achieved in that time uh hopefully number two how probably not great i start out and how I try and fix those mistakes in real time. Because um, that's a skill I think we need all the time, regardless of how high or low our confidence is, how much we've been playing, how much we've been practicing, how much we've been gigging. I think that's a skill we need to, to work on all the time. So a byproduct of the sight reading book is that there are certain things in there that are great for doing this. Some of the play alongs, like I said, great for repetition. This is two minutes and 43 seconds. Be my guest, fast forward, skip through it, uh, wherever you're listening or watching. Um, but if you do have the patience to listen for, for, for this time, um, hopefully you'll hear a few things developing in a, a relatively short space of time. It's going to feel way longer than two minutes and 43 seconds, but it is at the end of the day, just two minutes and 43 seconds.
Okay, so a bunch of things to unpack there. A few obvious things if you're watching. Um, maybe, you, maybe you saw them. Maybe they really stuck out. Um, and I want to recap them while they're still fresh on my mind. Uh, as I put my other in-ear back in, um, you'll notice that I did take one, in it, one, one ear out uh, partway through, about halfway through. There was some, there, there is something about the sound of the bass in in-ears, especially the way it's set up right now, that isn't set up the way I really want to hear it. The sound isn't fantastic. Sort of had, I did have a gig uh, Thursday night here in LA and all my stuff was packed up. So I sort of just threw the pedal board down, didn't really check anything, plugged it in, just made sure it was working. So that wasn't optimal. And there's another layer to that as well um, that I don't really want to practice on in-ears uh, if at all possible, when I'm trying to get that realistic feel of the instrument back, I want the feedback from the amp. I want that to the feeling of the air moving and that adjusts the way, especially with my picking hand, with my right hand, um, how I play the instrument. So I popped the in ear out. That was one thing in the beginning, closer to the beginning, there was, well, there was an issue with concentration as well. I completely missed a massive phrase towards the end of the cycle on one of them. And that's another thing that goes, you know, the ability to concentrate and to just be in, like really be in the music and not have any distractions. Obviously, this is a little unique. I have a camera in front of me. I'm conscious of talking to you, the audience. There is that there are other elements that are not going to exist on the gig, but there will be distractions on the gig, Distra distractions of, um, you know, a varying degree of, uh, of, of, of intense intensity, you know, maybe it's audience, maybe it's something that someone else in the band does, maybe there's a noise, lights, whatever it is. Um, so regardless, uh, I think it's really important to have that concentration element be kind of front and foremost with time and sound, but have the concentration thing be front and foremost, be like really in it, especially with something that's uh, repetitive like that. It's so easy with something that's repetitive to just be like, oh yeah, I've got this. I've, I've played it well a couple of times and I'm on autopilot now and I'm probably fine for the rest of this two minutes and 43 seconds. Yeah. Well, you heard that I absolutely wasn't. And despite my ability and my level and my experience and all of those things over the past 30 years of playing the instrument, it's still very easy to screw it up. And um, as I am conscious of that during my practice, that really helps. That's a, that, that can be a huge win when I get to the gig. So those are a few of the things I'm conscious of when I'm doing an exercise like that. Uh, it is, you know, there is going to need to be some basic stuff that I'll do uh, with my playing. And even now, like the, the EQ isn't really right. Um, oh, that's what I was doing. I was adjusting the EQ. There's, you know, when you put a bass in a gig bag, sometimes your EQ, your knobs can get uh, get bumped. And that, that, you know, when you're sitting home for a week or something, maybe you don't play a gig in a little while and you just put the bass on the stand, nothing gets moved around. You have everything set up perfectly. Trying to do, trying to adjust that on the fly is something I'm always kind of conscious of practicing. You know, I want to be able to identify while I'm playing this, you know, not that easy line, you know, it's quite a dense line. There are very few gaps in it in terms of being able to take my picking hand off the strings and adjust the EQ. So I'm really, that's just yet another thing to practice. It's like practicing stepping on pedals and getting the, hitting the right buttons at the right time. You know, being able to identify, oh, there's a little too much mid here. Or it doesn't sound like, you know, maybe the treble got rolled all the way off by mistake because it's like the the most outlying knob on the bass and it's easy to catch it on the on the seam of the gig bag. I don't know. Everyone's setup is a little different, uh, but I'm sure everyone's n experienced that at some point. Like something, some settings on some piece of gear got moved and you get on the gig and you're like, man, something's really wrong. But I'm really actually not sure what it is. And you got to listen, you got to be present, you got to move the thing that's screaming the loudest to the front of the queue in terms of troubleshooting. So that, that was what I was doing there. Um, not really that successfully to my ears because I didn't, I didn't really get it to where I wanted it in the in-ears. I think that's, that's what helped promote um, getting one ear out and just listening to the amp because it was way more realistic through the amp. Anyway, those are some of the things that were going on in my in my mind that I'm actively practicing that um, those aren't happy accidents uh, where things like that happen. Those are like, oh yeah, this could well happen on the gig. I could get to the gig and all my settings have changed in the first tune or whatever. 
I didn't notice at sound check or you know, there's just so many variables, right? And I'm always prepping for that and just reminding myself, you know, that, that those are options. It's so easy to switch some of those details off if you're not out gigging all the time. Um, and it's something I, I guess I kind of wish I was doing more often. I think I would benefit greatly from doing even just one or two gigs a week here in LA when I'm home. And that's not always possible. In fact, I've rarely done that the entire time I've lived in Los Angeles for 14, 15 years, how long it's been now. Um, but it's something I did in New York all the time for like a decade, you know, like 10, 11 years or something, just gigging all the time that I was in town, sometimes two gigs a night in different places. You know, it, it would be rare to have a month that had less than 20 gigs in it. And I probably played 20 gigs in a year in L.A., so gives you an idea of, yeah, of course, that, that factoring in that life is different now. I'm not 23. I'm not just saying yes to absolutely everything. Some of those gigs were garbage, even though I learned probably a shitload from a lot of the crappy gigs. Uh, a lot of those gigs I used to do in New York, I would, you know, wouldn't even consider now. But it's, uh, it's an interesting thing to think about and to learn how to compensate for in the practice routine. And um, yeah, it's something, I guess... I'm a pretty confident person in general. Like there isn't a lot of stuff, at least musically speaking, that phases me. Uh, but if I was to pick out one thing where that can sometimes be an issue, it would definitely be the lack of practice sort of diminishing my confidence going to the gig. And just maybe that's also experience. That's just knowing that, yeah, my chops aren't going to be in shape. Like I hadn't played a gig in a while um, before Thursday night, for instance. And it was pretty intense, you know, ended up being two keyboard players. And then our old friend Damian Reed, fantastic drummer that we've known since the 90s in Boston. And um, yeah, just bad dude and a totally different dynamic from gene uh, just a different approach so you know we, we almost feels which is a great thing by the way it almost feels like we're playing some of that music for the first time um there were even a couple of brand new tunes as well so a lot of things to be on one's toes about and then just noticing like the back of my thumb on my left hand my my, my fretting hand um oh and it looks like we're going to catch this one right away this time because it looks like the camera just shit the bed and we're only going to drop a few frames. I'm glad I saw that in real time. We'll have to go and recover that afterwards. Um, hey. But yeah, just as I was holding my thumb up to the camera, maybe just didn't like the look of my thumb, but um, the, you know, the, the, what do you call it? The, the meaty part, the, the, the part of the thumb that connects with connects with the back of the neck of the bass, that was giving me some issues. There was a little bit of pain there and it was just completely out of shape in terms of the grip on the left hand. And it got better. It wasn't like it deteriorated and I couldn't play by the end of the gig. It was some like, oh, I got to stretch this out. I got to be a little more relaxed. It was telling me I was probably gripping a little too hard because I hadn't been playing that much. Just all of those tiny details that um that that really come to the forefront when you're not you know when you're not exercising those muscles enough if you don't if you don't use it you lose it and certain things atrophy whether that's mental things or physical things um, i definitely noticed that on, on this past thursday and hopefully i'll get some clips up of that show because it was a really really fun show and uh make a video maybe about the difference of playing with someone who you play with all the time like gene and we know the music inside out and then what a brand new sort of wild card like a, someone you know real well and have played with a lot but someone that you haven't played that music with how that affects the situation that'd be a good one to talk about I'm thinking out loud here uh but yeah so those those are little things that will be that are right now on my radar that are in the to-do list queue uh, to make sure I'm I'm not fucking up on the gig come Saturday, you know. And it's let's put let's put it in context. It's a gig at a club called Sam First in LA, nice little jazz club out by the airport. Um, it's a gig that you may look at on the service guy. It's a little jazz gig in a little jazz club. You may easily find ways to justify its importance as not being well it's not in an arena with some huge thing or blah 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 blah. but it's actually these moments well for me it's all musical moments 
I've, I've gotten to the point in my life where I'm, I'm really not saying yes to anything unless I'm totally committed. So I kind of carry this to everything. This just happens to be this week's example. And it's a massively important gig. You know, I could, as, as I try and clarify, as I try and classify every gig that I play, the next gig, it is like the most important gig of my life. That's how I approach it. Um, because I think the music deserves the respect uh, and it doesn't deserve any more or less respect than the gig I just played on Thursday. Um, but there are certain elements of it that hold a very special place uh, in my musical upbringing, in my musical taste, the, the music we're playing, the people involved. Um, so th there's, it's very easy to put a little bit of added pressure on yourself, especially if you're already feeling like, ah, my confidence isn't at a hundred percent. Maybe it's like 87.43% or something. Um, and you really want it to be like 95% plus uh, at all times, at least. So it's, it's easy to put a little bit of extra pressure. Like, oh shit, that's Larry Goldings. I've been listening to him my entire life. And he's on these 200 albums that I've, that have changed the way I think about music. And that's Clarence Penn. He's one of my favorite drummers ever. Um, you know, and, and like, oh, and that's Bob and me and Bob are kind of in it together. And like, we're actually playing some of Bob's music and one new tune. So I, I want to give that like the ultimate amount of respect and make sure I'm not the weak link. So there are all those ways that it can be easy to talk yourself into a little bit of a corner of insecurity. Um, and then it's these, you know, um, these exercises, this repetition, at least for me, that's what works for me. It's not going to work the same for everyone. I think everyone is super different in their approach and in what it takes to get you to the point where you are as comfortable as, as, as you need to be. So, uh, be aware of that as well. It's not a one size fits all. It's just a suggestion of, Hey, check it out. This is what I'm doing literally in real time i always like to like to give you the the thing that's happening now you know um and tell you like what it is i've been doing consistently through my career that helps that helps the overall thing um i'm a big fan of updating the idea when the information changes or the set of circumstances change or you know the the you know the requirements change and that has had to happen many many times over the over the recent you know five six seven years especially with wife and kid and moving house and this and that like completely restructuring life there's there have been massive changes to that um so i'm always happy to bring the updated version of what's going on um and and let you see the inside of that and uh, yeah so this episode gonna be on the shorter side because i just literally need to get back to this repetition and give it give it the respect it, it deserves and hopefully be able to bring you some some cool footage from the show i'll have my gopro there as always so i'll be recording the show but it's also available for streaming i think both sets are available um it's this coming saturday the 19th of october 2024 if you're hearing this in time you can go to sam first i believe it's samfirst.com you can go to my website it's linked there um, if you're in la by all means come down grab a ticket and come and see the show live is going to be super fun but if you're somewhere else around the world you can uh you can <laughs> well, I tell you what you can go and grade me you know you can um, marks out of a hundred or something or you can sit there with little cards with numbers on them holding them up although shit we won't be able to see them i don't think there's a chat stream i'm not sure actually but um you can chime in uh, come back and get in the comments and um, see what my grade was. Did I pass? Did I skate? Was it a C minus and I just skated to a pass? Or did we get up in the B plus or A minus department? Um, you let me know. I will let you know because this will be a good one to report in on next week and see where I got myself to. Did I get myself to the place that I wanted to? Did I ultimately, which is you know always the goal, did I have fun playing the music? You know, was it worth all of the work? so far 30 years it hasn't not been worth the work a single time like the work has always paid off um i'm eternally grateful to whatever i need to be grateful for um to have that love for the work that's been probably the most central yeah the most central tool to my entire uh process has just been loving doing the work we get into the details you know those those come later 
That's why I write these books. Um, like I said, you can get what I was just playing in the podcast, Bass Player's Guide to Sight Reading. That's one of many play-alongs in there. Uh, maybe you get it for the play-alongs and for the repetition, and the byproduct is that you get to learn some reading, reading for the bass, some sight reading. Um, for me, it's a sight reading book that the byproduct is you get some repetition, you get some cool things to practice with, not just read. And then, of course, I must remind you that the pre-sale for the new book, the bassist's book of scales and arpeggios, and possibly in the title and study scales arpeggios and study is up for pre-sale right now it is at the bundle price because we're bundling the digital copy with the signed physical copy um that that is a pre-sale price that will go up come november 27th when the book launches and it will no longer be bundled if you want the digital copy or the signed copy you'll have to buy them as different things um bundling digital and physical products is a kind of a pain in the ass. So we're doing the one-off. Um, and as you can see, if I, I wonder if I can show you this, I don't know. It's like prepping for Armageddon back here at these one, two, three, four boxes of bubble mailers, uh, extra boxes of, um, uh, uh, labels for the label maker. I mean, it's going to be totally insane. Um, we have done many hundreds of pre-sales. I cannot thank you enough for that. It's going crazy every day, which is a beautiful thing. It, the work is paying off. Um, most importantly, the, I'm doing something that connects with people, which is the, the, biggest, uh, the biggest reward. And I look forward to being able to make more videos about this stuff, about scales, about arpeggios, about how I integrate them into my play and getting really specific. Like what is the hungarian major and why the fuck should you know about it you know and maybe you shouldn't maybe the question is like do you need to know about this or that or the other there are so many questions that a book like this can answer um which is something i think that perhaps i mean you tell me get in the comments and let me know maybe that is something a reason why it's connecting with uh with people more than some of the other stuff because it is one of those books that is for everyone like if you start with a major scale and that's all you need, then great. The book is for you. Like if you want to know what Ukrainian Dorian is and why there's a sharp 11 on it, then shit, that, the book is also for you. Um, you know, I fall into all of those categories. I love the nerdy stuff, the stuff I, you know, th there's been stuff, absolutely stuff in the book that I didn't know about before because I wanted to do some in-depth stuff. Um, so I did some research and there are things that I did not know, which was awesome to find find out some new information and to actually practice that myself. Really, really cool. Um, then there was some stuff that I had used in my playing and in my practice routine for many 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 years but had never put a label to it and had not necessarily thought about it in more than one way for instance maybe only one fingering or only one position or one inversion so then there was development with that and then there was like all the stuff i i knew i knew like the really the stuff that's so ingrained not only in my playing but theoretically too uh from an analysis uh standpoint so for me it was like a, a massive job it's been a year in the making uh, and many hundreds if not thousands of hours have gone into it but it was has been a massive payoff just musically so far uh for me and i kind of like quote unquote knew it all most of it at least <laughs> before i wrote it so even the dude who wrote the book learned something in the process which i was just awesome for me um definitely gotta definitely gotta share that with you guys and girls of the bass world but that's it really appreciate you coming along for the ride of how I might possibly get my uh, confidence to where it needs to be this week for a, a really quite special gig. Um, perhaps some of you will even see it if you go check out the streaming version of it. Or if you're here in LA, come join us on the 19th of October, 2024. All other tour dates at the website. Presale is linked below in the description of the video. Make sure you're signed up to the newsletter. It's completely free. It is not spam. And uh, that's where I put out things like this, like the podcast. Can't thank you enough for spending some of your insanely precious time with me talking about music, learning about the bass. And I'll see you all on the next episode. Mm -hmm.